just in case you haven't heard, I've started a new weekly teacher's class. Each week, people, mostly podcast listeners like yourself, come together live online to engage me and each other in debate and dialogue and inquiry into many of the topics that I discuss with my guests here on the podcast. This week, we talked about the difference between yoga and yoga therapy, if there is one, and whether or not yoga teachers are frauds if they don't practice what they're teaching, and how to meet the expectations of students when they come into your class wanting something other than what you teach. And lastly, we talked about reclaiming practice as something more than just fitness. The conversations are interesting and informative, and I want to invite you to get in on it. It's the J. Brown Yoga Teachers Class. You can find it at jbrownyoga.com. Okay, here we are. This is J. Brown Yoga Talks Podcast. My name is Jay Brown. I would like to say welcome and thanks. Probably not a surprise to many of you, but maybe you're new. Maybe you're not used to my usual opening. In either case, I'm very happy to be with you. Thanks to everyone for investing some of your time and brain power to be listening to this. We are at the tail end of summer, aren't we? My eldest daughter is starting the fourth grade today, the day that this is posting. Long-time listeners might remember me speaking about her when she was in first and second grade. (laughs) My wife took her to get, like, new school clothes and stuff, and, you know, no more pink. All just, like, cool big kid stuff. It's just amazing how much time feels real, even though it doesn't exist. (laughs) How about you? How are you guys doing? You guys got kids going back to school? If you don't, that's cool. I'm not saying you need to have kids. Just, you know, making conversation and all. I hope you had a good week. I want to thank many of you for all of the engagement After my talk last week with Gary Craftsow, I got quite a bit of emails. There was common threads, people discussing this topic of yoga and yoga therapy, and also lots of responses from the blog that I put out last week, which was called Yoga Teacher Heal Thyself. If you didn't get a chance to check that out, you might. All kinds of interesting conversations happening And I'm just so grateful for that. That is my ultimate goal with doing this, is that we will talk about important things and we will make smart choices for ourselves. So I feel very encouraged and inspired when I hear from you that you are doing that. So please always continue to feel welcome to reach out. You guys rock. This week on the podcast, I'm talking with Mirka Kraftsau. And you know what? We talked for kind of a while. It was kind of a lengthy chat that we had. So because of that, I am going to forego some of my usual musings here in the intro. Now, many of you out there are now celebrating. Yay! No long-winded intro from Jay. But others might be a little disappointed. I know some of you like that part of the podcast. It is a little bit up against the wire for me this week. And as I said, my talk with Mirka is kind of lengthy, so we're going to get straight to it. Before we do, though, let me mention that this episode of Yoga Talks is sponsored by YogaLifestyle.com. And Yoga Lifestyle is a company that I know firsthand. When I owned my yoga center in Brooklyn for 10 years, this is where I got all my yoga-related supplies, mats and blocks and bolsters, all the stuff that you might need to help support your practice and study of yoga. Ray Greenberg, he's the owner of yogalifestyle.com. He's been on the podcast before. You can go back and listen to that episode. We talk all about the company and how about it's independently owned. And he's got some really unique stuff. He's got the Becca Long Life mats, which is my preferred mat. He's got these wedge teardrop bolsters that are pretty cool. 
So if you're like me and you want to support businesses that are actually rooted in yoga more than the profit margins of corporations, put your dollars where your beliefs are and go to yogalifestyle.com. This episode of Yoga Talks is also sponsored by KarmaSoft, your complete online yoga studio management solution. You've heard me talk about KarmaSoft before. I use this software myself at my yoga center as well. And in my opinion, it's far superior than MindBodyOnline. If you or someone you know is a yoga, Pilates, or fitness center owner, manager, or teacher, and you have to do the work of scheduling and class payments and accounting, all of it can be made far easier and more efficient by using KarmaSoft. I have certainly been saying this since long before they were a sponsor of the podcast, you can go back and listen to the episode that I recorded with the founder of KarmaSoft, Rudy Sinekal. He's a fantastic person. I just can't recommend it enough. Go check it out, karmasoftonline.com. Okay, let me say one or two quick things about today's talk with Mirka. This is the second to last episode of my TKV Desikachar episodes that came out of the conference at Kripalu in June that Leslie Kamenoff hosted. And going into this conversation, I knew very little about Mirka. And I went online and did some research, but there isn't that much there. So I just, I didn't know much about her. I didn't know anything really about her and Gary's relationship or anything. So at some points, I feel that I was ignorant of things I might have known about. <laughs> In any case, it all works out just fine. You will hear for yourself. Mirka is a very powerful and passionate and special energy on the earth. And I believe it comes through in today's talk. Before we get to it real quick, let me drop my stuff. I am going to be in Hamilton, New Jersey, September 15th. I'm going to be in Burlington, Vermont, September 22nd, 23rd. And I'm going to be back in Carlisle, Pennsylvania again, September 29th and 30th. You can find out about those gigs and more. You can listen to the archives of this podcast or read my blog. The one I was mentioning from last week is there. Or you can find my online yoga video stuff. That includes my brand new teacher's class, which you heard about at the top, and my live stream subscription to my regular ongoing weekly classes, and my DVD and downloads for home practice, and my online workshop, Gentle is the New Advanced. All of that stuff can be found at jbrownyoga.com. All right, so I will touch base with you on the other side. I'll say a little bit about next week's episode with Larry Payne, but for now, let's get to this conversation that I had with Mirka Kraftsau. I think we got it. Hello. Hi. Well, how are you, Mirka? I'm well, and I'm drinking a little water now. And you're in California? I am uh, in California. I am in Sebastopol, a little town, a uh, lovely town that uh, became our home after we moved from Maui. Oh, and how long ago did you move there from Maui? Uh, Maui was our home. That's where I became a woman and got married, started pioneering yoga with my young husband and uh, um, had a child. We built a home. We had a child. And then everything got nice and big, too big to be in Maui. Huh. And then... Uh, the you mean you mean with the kids. teaching and all that stuff got too big? You couldn't... You, you, well, that... Well, uh, let me ask you something. Are we already on recording? We are. So I think I would like to start again. Why? You didn't like where we started? I, I did, but it's like... Uh, um, okay, I can... I mean, 
I, to me, it's just like we're having this conversation and that's what, that's exactly what's happening. I'm getting to know you. I'm getting to speak with you. I was curious to hear about, you know, Maui and when you came to California already, I had a little bullet point to start there. And so we just jumped right in. Well, it's true. And the reason why I stop is because this life is being truly so far so rich. Mm. Okay. So rich. And uh, being together uh, at Kripalu a few weeks ago, a month ago, all together to honor, you know, the presence of Sir Dasikachar in our lives. And uh, I just turned 60 and uh, it seems like a big number, you know, hmm. but I feel so rich and fresh in all of this uh, this life and the big part, the influence that uh, the presence of Desikachar and the teaching that we receive, the love that we receive, the guidance we have received has directed my life because I met Gary in Maui, you see. So I was born in Treviso uh, near Venice in Italy. So I had my little, my journey um, to come from a little town outside Venice to find myself at 27 to meet Gary in the island of Maui. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yes, well, 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 let me say one thing. First of all, you know, the conference in Kripalu was amazing. And I, I think I mentioned an email to you, you, you played such an important um, function and role there. You were the only woman up on the stage there. And you brought such an important um, energy to the room. And you're doing the same for this podcast, because I had all the people who were up on the stage with you coming on the podcast. So I, I, I'm having you here to do it for the podcast as well. And I guess I would be curious to hear a little bit about how you got from a small town in Italy to Maui in the first place. Like, how does that happen? How do you, how do you find your way from a small town in in Italy to yoga? Was there a lot of yoga where you, when you were growing up? Oh, no, at all, my friend. (laughs) (laughs) Not at all. I come from a lovely little village where there was only one God and only one church and what that was quite perfect. So uh, it was all, uh, you know, the, the, the web of, uh, of my old life uh, was the, um, the Roman Catholic at his best, you might say, mm-hmm. and the sense that um, there was a life that for me as a child was rich and uh, woven with balance and harmony post-war. So um, there was um, there was a feeling of, for me as a child, there was a feeling of belonging, was a feeling of harmony, and all the life was around the church, the fields, and the village. So it's a flat land near Venice, and it's a rich land with, uh, with Mother Nature and a lot of water and a lot of uh, rivers and uh, water flowing from the earth. It's so, so generous. So I was deeply mystical without deep knowing. It was part of my life, you know, uh, of, uh, of uh, being in contact with nature and uh, doing prayers before I went to bed to my angels and, uh, you know, offering the, we call it, i fioretti, uh, the, the effort of my most loving action for uh, the goodness of all. So the metta, I practice it, you know. So, so in that way, it was precious. And in the same time, as soon as I became a teenager, the life force that I am, you, you have met me. <laughs> yeah, and, you're like, I got to see the rest of the world. I felt the same way. I was like, I got to get out of here. And I hit 18, I left. Yes. And so for me, it was, uh, uh, I didn't particularly need to leave. I just, there was the deep in, uh, inquiry of what is true. Hmm. Who is God then? Who, who is Jesus? Are they speaking the truth? They are not. So I hmm. kept the, the deep love for my intimacy 
with the way of living that had deep value of love. You mm. might say the love, the message of Jesus in his essence, you know. Mm. And, uh, and, and the, the mystical nature of where you grew up, as you described, you know, just being there in that place. You are so right. Now I can say that's, the, that's why for 25 years I've been inspired and passionate about bringing people to the city of Assisi, which is the home of St. Clair and St. Francis. Now we call them just Francis and Claire, this wonderful two yogis of the 1200, because the, 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 the mysticism, besides the old life of, you know, the 21 centuries, it's uh, doing its thing with materialistic approach to everything. So mm -hmm. even spirituality has become a way to make a living. Mm -hmm. So as a tourist town. But Assisi is tangible in its uh, mysticism. If you're open for that, you d just taste it. Mm -hmm. So that's the beauty of being surrounded by temple dedicated to spirit. Mm -hmm. All right. So where do you go first when you leave the, the town that you grew up? Where do you go first? Well, when I saw so the, 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 the push wasn't so much trying to see the world. The push was to know the truth and to live in alignment with the highest truth. So one was to serve and love others. So I found myself, of course, in service. I wanted to go to Africa and help people. Then I realized uh, there were enough people to help around me. Uh, I went into the women's movement, but not so much the women's movement, just but really, I'm more of a doer. But what is, what is, I see how spirit guide me, life force guide me. I respond to the, what is around me. And so I help, I find myself being in the environment with the uh, women's health and uh, um, mm. wanting the law of divorce, which I didn't know I was young. I didn't understand that, but that was the issue at that time. Mm. And um, the health for the women and the right to, of choice. And so that was very powerful for me. I, I saw that my life force wasn't so interested in getting married or having a great career. It was to serve. It was to be in service. It was, was really, you know, now I can say in this ways, but uh, I can speak in this way. But when I was younger, it was just um, what you can say. If you know me, it's just they call it my love, my passion. But so that very, very quickly got me to be up in the government. I was invited to be part of a um, house representative with my, my friend that we were in this work because the law passed that gave all that support to women's health and choice and so on. And, um, and I couldn't go. I really felt that that was not my place. I didn't want to be educated in politics. I felt there was something. So there is some life force that I want to honor here that guided me to be where I am now and to, be, to have been part of this uh, pioneering, uh, sincere pioneering, humble pioneering of this profound teaching of yoga uh, to our world. Mm -hmm. But we did it really... A person at a time, a step at a time. We weren't thinking we will become yoga teachers. We weren't thinking we will make yoga teacher training or we, we would be part of, this would be our career. It was more of a dharma. Mm -hmm. But before we found, um, found myself in, in the yoga again, that was the women's movement or being servants with that need of justice for that to, to, to soothe the suffering of uh, generation and generation of women not having choice, not having a choice in so many ways. So it was really uh, tangible. And then from there, I got the spiritual crisis, you might have say, I may say, I really looked deeply and I saw that I needed to know what was the truth. And I left everything because a friend said that there was this person in India <laughs> that spoke about the teaching of Jesus in a way that my heart could 
could respond. So, Jay, I'm saying this because actually it wasn't that I want to go away and see the world. Mm. Since I'm here with you now in the quiet space of my home, I feel tender and say this. I never said before. This life force guided me, guided me. And I could not do anything else but follow it. Mm. And brought me to India and it brought me to continue, you know, to make choices. When I arrived at this ashram in India, uh, it was fantastic. The teaching were f- fantastic. But so we're talking about we're talking about Osho, right? Or was it Rajneesh back then? It was Rajneesh right then. Yeah, because I remember lot- I remember getting um, Rajneesh books, and like you, I remember this book was called the Orange Book, and it was like profoundly helpful to me. Like it had all these wonderful meditations in it. I remember really using it, and I didn't even know that he 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 became what people knew as Osho later. And it's so okay. So how old were you when you went to the ashram? Twenty four when I arrived there. Mm. Twenty four, and uh, before I went there, I was there with uh, my boyfriend at that time and another two friends, and uh, we. we took a ride through ja- Rajasthan and I recall you know being in this world which it wasn't my desire to go to India it just that's what I told my sister wouldn't you not go if you knew that Jesus was alive <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I went to India right around that time too in my early 20s also it's like that's a time in your life where you're really trying to figure out who you are in the world you know yes yeah Yes. So I was very passionate, as I still am. Yeah. And, uh, and so I want to tell you about when I went in Rajasthan, it was a moment that was pivotal for me. And uh, I, I was uh, um, aware that my dream were filled with colors. And I think it was the first time that I, I came aware at another level of my inner awareness. I wasn't even doing meditation in that way. I knew that I heard about this word meditation. I wanted to know, you know. And with Osho, what I learned was like that there were meditation was also part of moving and dancing and celebrating. And I go, oh my God, I like that. Yeah. To be mystic outside of the church, to be able for mystic, I mean, to be in that fullness in that celebrate there is something magical for me sometime you know in the religion religious experience and then I would feel it in nature and then I would feel it as I was I didn't know it was service but as I was in service with my dharma with a woman there was an aliveness there that that's what I wanted in life and did you like how how many people were there because i knew it grew over time when you got there it was so beautiful it was there was like a open uh, pagoda you know and he would come and teach and speak they're very little he was so frail uh he was so mm, just a little spirit basically we didn't have too much personal contact but when he spoke even if my English was very simple, you know, we were, there was such a silence. There was hundreds of people under that pagoda. And I was young, and I think most of us were young. And uh, we were so in reverence. And you know now, we know, yoga is the doorway to reverence. And then in our own heart and mind, we recognize that and rest in that the best way we can. Atta yoga anushasana, we begin away again, you know, mm. entering this space the best way we can of this reverence. Well, so you got to hear him speak because after a while he, he stopped speaking publicly. Do you? Do well, you... no, that time I was there, he spoke. Yeah. Once a, a day in the morning. And then mostly there were meditations. So we sat in meditation. Then afterwards 
we do we did very simple uh, music meditation then people could go and do all the different meditation that you had and the li- you saw in the little orange book they were all available my particularly the zen approach and it was like it's a spirit of meditation there was really for meditation now i mean reverence respect uh, harmony but there was also a lot of um uh, connection, which it wasn't much around the world, people, people hugging each other in silence, you know, so there was a lot of tenderness. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, that's what I saw. I didn't do the heavy duty um, workshops at that time. Mm-hmm. I couldn't. It was already big enough to, for me, for my energy field, for my to take in all of that. So you could just decide, like, you just didn't go to some of those other crazy sessions? No, 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 no. That was all decide, you will ask, and then they suggest what you were ready for it. It was very respectful. And what you experienced there as a visitor was just very loving. But mm-hmm. overall, what it was for me, I was there a few months, was that... I kept my inquiry kept going deeper and deeper as I enter the space of meditation and being in the environment. And I felt um, I I wasn't sure. It wasn't clear for me. I was young. I was, I guess, a beautiful human being, and there was a lot of sexuality there, very open. So I, you know, was a little bit uncomfortable with that pressure. Mm. And in fact, if I want, you want to know, I never made love there. So for those that have an idea, that it, was <laughs> all an order, it wasn't so. Yeah. It wasn't so. You had choice. Mm. And the choice was very, um, you really have to want to go in. Whatever you're, you feel ready to learn, maybe art, maybe Gurdjieff dances, maybe Zen observing the wall or, you know, the Sufi dancing or simply sit in quiet meditation. So much of that were available, but many of us needed therapy and Mm. that was available too. We didn't even know what it was (laughs) called the encounters. Mm. And honestly, I was scared from what I heard. I felt I wasn't ready to be in that pressure cooker. So I sent a I got to send a note. We can send a note to Osho, to Bhagwan at that time. Mm. And I asked, I said, "Um, I'm not sure that that's my place. And the answer was something so beautiful. And it was to enter this journey, which was called sannyas, you know, to let go of who you think you are and enter a path of discovering who, who you really are. It has to be out of joy. To me, that's what he said. Let it be your joy. So I felt so joyful receiving that, that I I said, I'm leaving. (laughs) (laughs) Your joy was saying, let's leave. (laughs) And and I went and I did. I left all my luggage. I went like a sadhu. I don't even know. What happened in my awareness that I did that, that I had the courage to do that? I was an Indian, for God's sake. I was in Pune, and I knew. So we, I did a ritual to burn all the photos, to give the gifts that I had with me, to give the gifts of my camera to somebody. I wore only one dress that was red. I didn't have the mala at that time. How, how long were you there before you left? Uh, few months, two yeah. months or so. Yeah. And then uh, I just uh, remember I took a train and I went north because it was too hot for me. And then uh, my spirit of the journey, I took the spirit with me. I would wash my dress in the night and wear it in the morning. <laughs> and had a little bag. And by myself, I went travel. I, I feel really choked up with this. Oh. You know, the spirit guided me to do that and the safety that I felt. And I went all the way to Pokhara, 
which mm. is in Kathmandu. Mm-hmm. I know. Near Kat- uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, you know? Yeah. Well, I took a little bit of a similar journey. I went from I took I went from Rishikesh to Kathmandu, and I remember that on the map, <laughs> that town. So I got sick before I reached Kathmandu. So it was about three from Delhi. It was about three or four days travel. Yeah. Wow. The bus. And then I stopped in Pokhara. And there also I got to meet the Tibetan people for the first time. Mm-hmm. And I got to help the people, you know, remember me, the good Christian helping mm-hmm. the, the thing, the Dharma, mm-hmm. of, of the joy, the joy of helping. And I, I was for, few, for a month or so with uh, a group of a small village in Pokhara, living with nothing and that was my and being with them and helping them and that was a bit that was my sannyasi inner practice was my retreat in Pokhara. (laughs) you know well you know when you tell me that i have a very specific memory i landed in delhi and you know you're all jet lagged and i was really freaked out like people weren't being nice to us and we just felt really freaked out and my friend was a buddhist and he said Let's go to Dharmasal. That's where the Buddhists are. They'll show us compassion. <laughs> so we, we took a bus up there. and We made a stop in, I believe, a town called Manale on the way up there. Yes. And, and, and I, was, I just remember I was in the hotel room and I was finally calming down. And I looked out the window and there was a group of Tibetan women, I believe nuns, and they were doing laundry. And they were singing songs and dancing as the process of folding the laundry. And it was just the most beautiful thing. I think one of the more beautiful moments I've ever witnessed on the planet of like taking this totally mundane activity of like taking the laundry off of the lines, you know, but doing it in this like incredible, beautiful way. So I don't know when you talk about your sannyasin and Pukko, I think of those Tibetan women. <laughs> Right? Mm, yeah. and, and, and so you see, that was the joy, the freedom that also I received from Osho. It's like, trust yourself. This is not becoming somebody. Trust yourself and that energy carry with me. You know, I didn't need to have the mala. I, it was deep with me. And for me, it was the, the Nepali woman. Oh, my God. You know? So what else? I mean, I'm curious. You just you mentioned that. You, you felt that that's what you took from Osho, other than like the reverence and the meditation. Were there other teachings that you remember from him that stick with you? Well, then you see, after my journey to India, which lasted about a year, I, I got a little malaria. Mm. And so I, I, when I was home, I had to deal with that <laughs> in Italy. But <laughs> yeah. so, so uh, there was... Um, as I got better from uh, the journey of malaria, um, which took a few months, I really, um, well, there was a few things. My dad was really wonderful. He tried to hold me home, so he gave my, my diary. He wasn't sure I was getting married the way I was going. So he to protect me and gave me some money to buy a little house. Mm. And the country he said, just get something, you know, this is the the family that I had. This is the principle and the care that those simple people had in that village. He was trying to settle you down a little bit. Right. And so I did, you know, I honor and I took care of that and I did that. And I, and, uh, mm, abundance is, uh, I didn't know then, but abundance of, uh, materiality, it was not supposed to be of any hindrance to me. Mm. You know, it's like things will happen. I will do it with joy. Abundance will come. And so I had this little house. We, we bought two acres of land and blah, 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 blah. But mm. I couldn't do it. Mm. I remember my sister came see this little beautiful cottage and a beautiful magical land next to a lovely lake called Lake uh, Vico near Rome, north of Rome. And I told my sister... I have to go. I mm. need to be with my teacher. And I became sannyas in Florence. I took the, I surrender to the journey of being in, you know, 
to, to dress red and wear the necklace. Oh, so how how long between the first time you went to Osho and well, then when you became Sanyas? And how long did you have a house one, period? A year. Just a year. It, it didn't even last time. that long. Well, no. there you go. Well, you had a taste of something beyond that life. That, exactly. Yeah. And, and uh, I, you know, I didn't particularly, I, I, well, I woke up one night that I felt, oh, I was in Greece. Uh, no, in Crete. So after mm. that, I was still healing from uh, from the malaria, which particularly hit the liver for me. And uh, I went to visit a friend in Greece that I met. Uh, you know, I was a traveler. Mm. You get you get a certain way of living when you travel in that grace. And uh, and when I was there, I turned twenty five, and I had one of those moments that I knew death was imminent. And so I remember I was my, by myself walking in this village where there wasn't tourists, trust me. There were a little bit of a mule that you could go if you needed help. No, mm. You couldn't walk. There weren't even cars. And uh, I knew I was going to die. And uh, I had that deep, deep, you know, uh, moment. And, uh, and that was before I die, I have to be at the feet of their master. <laughs> mm, so that bad. was your thought. You were like, I gotta go where my because spirit I, takes me. And so you, you, you left. How'd your dad feel about that? Oh, everybody's being very kind. <laughs> I think they had prayed a lot for me, but I left. I yeah. left and one way ticket and I went to the state. Um, so I you didn't went know to what I was getting into. So you didn't go back to India though. You went to Florence. You no, said? he was already. He was already. Uh, oh, he had moved to the to United States. So you came to the states to live within the community. Well, yes, I took my. I took a year to experience that. By then, already I have. I took the sannyas in Florence, and already by then, my name. My name is uh, Santosh which now I know from yoga, <laughs> um, it means contentment, the ultimate contentment, almost like the title of the fourth chapter of the Yoga Sutra, Kaivalya, mm. the ultimate state of fullness. So contentment and um, santosh, gyanda. And gyanda means the wisdom. And so the word really, the, the, the name that then uh, became the insight then now I can say, oh, my God, <laughs> what a name he gave me, mm. which is like a, a doorway, you know, um, a ticket for a journey. And it's uh, that in wisdom, there is contentment. Mm. Or when we are in the state of Santosh, there is wisdom. So, yes, I got that when I was in Florence. And then I went visit. But by being Italian, you see, by being Italian... We weren't uh, welcome to stay at the um, ashram because you are you don't have the green card. Oh. So that saved me for b being. <laughs> I see. So you never really totally moved there, but you visited it. No, you couldn't. But you know, um, it was so different than Pune. Oh, it was so different. Yeah. It's like that movie. Have you seen the movie from? Yes, Netflix? I did see the documentary. It was work, work, work. It was a total different energy. Yeah. I don't know. Living there must have been different, of did, course. Did you meet Sheila? Of course. Oh, my yes. gosh. Wow. You were there. How much time did you spend there? Oh, no. I only was there uh, a week for the first celebration and then yeah. a week for the second celebration. And then I took – and then I was done. Uh, all the – the politics and all the strange things and all that we need to get married to go there. It was like, that's enough for me. Well, they had like ashrams all over the world. Did you have other community that you were part yes, of? Yes, yeah. I was in Santa Cruz, the community of Santa Cruz and uh, uh, San Francisco, but particularly Santa Cruz in those uh, a year I was there about. And that's where we did our practices every day, you mm. know morning at six o'clock we did the kundalini practice in the evening 
the um, no in the morning the dynamic in the evening the kundalini they were important important days for me of inner work we did a lot of therapy work very very important work where with courage we look deep into our deep samskaras it was beautiful it was powerful so it when when, work. when things got really weird and crazy what what did you think then about i just uh, wanted out yeah and uh so i was uh, <laughs> in my voice i remember i said uh enough with this spiritual journey <laughs> <laughs> you're like i'm done with it yeah. and so uh, i was ready to go but i met a friend that we were living together in kathmandu from american i can tell you a magic story here still life carrying me mm. and uh, she said you have to come uh, you have to come to this place it's called maui mm-hmm. and i said what is maui <laughs> mm-hmm. And uh, she was already a student of Gary. Of course, we didn't know. I but see. she invited me to Maui and I couldn't resist. She, she said, I have a place, just go. And I said, okay, I will come there for, for a, you know, a month and then I go home. Enough of this. I need to go back home. Mm-hmm. I need to find my balance again. What is real? <laughs> yeah. What is real? Mm-hmm. And, um, and so there it is. I went to another journey uh, with courage, you know, because it was like, oh, my God, you know, take a plane, go to a little island. And, and, and Maui's amazing, you know, like just yeah, the nature, I, the nature you know, there is, is, is also a healing in of itself, you know. So I didn't know, you yeah. know. I thought yeah. I would be there a month or something, and then, oh, my God. Uh, Jay, oh like, my God. You're like, here's the paradise right here. But I got received like a queen, you know, again, queenly. Friends that I didn't know, that my friend um, got to, call, to pick me up at the airport, take me to the ocean for sunset. I had a beautiful place in Maui Metal, seeing, you know, the ocean and the beautiful beaches. We would go to the beach every day like that. Mm. I was held in amazing love, in this amazing beauty. And then one night, first, second night, walking on the beach, I said, oh, my God, maybe I could he- be here. I want us to study acupuncture mm. and Chinese medicine and Qigong. You know, I want to en- mm-hmm. work with energy work. And the other thing that I wanted to go was to go to Bali to learn tempo dances. <laughs> <laughs> well, you had done some dancing at the Osho Ashram, I'm sure. Exactly. Yeah. And what and what um, a powerful healing. That's the, the techno, the, you know, the methodology and the science behind the Alpha and Omega. Osho mm-hmm. Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh wrote many. They wrote a lot of volume on the teaching of Patanjali, but I never studied it then. They, I only knew that they were called the Alpha and the Omega. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, so when, when do you first go to yoga class in Maui? When do you meet Gary? Okay. So I am more into the dance. I think that my journey is more a tantric journey. I'm not a yogi. It doesn't feel like I fit with that, Mm -hmm. (laughs) I thought. So in all of that, I hurt my neck. My neck is always being delicate. So I was talking with some friends in Maui, um, and they said, Oh, you have to meet this person. He just arrived from India. He teach yoga, but it's not yoga, normal yoga, because we had a lot of Sangha yoga. Yeah. In, it was very powerful yogi at that time. David Williams and very, very, and Patabi Joyce were very, very alive there. And, uh, and uh, he said, this one, he does therapy yoga. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Maui Yoga Therapy, he told us about exactly. it. Exactly, mm-hmm. and there it is. Mm. And then I never went to that school, but uh, uh, my friend introduced me to to this young man, and he said, "This is the man I was telling you that he does the yoga." Mm. <laughs> so you so, didn't meet you didn't meet him in class, though. No, no, no. We oh. met. Uh, we met. Uh, we were introduced at a party, and uh, 
right away, Gary Kraftsoff, such a beautiful being, told me, you are pretty smart. And I thought, as English, my second language, I go, what a strange thing to tell a woman. <laughs> yes, he complimented you on your intellect, eh? Right. <laughs> now, you know, if you like want to say to somebody, hey, you're beautiful, right? I'm oh. Latino, I'm, I'm Italian. Yeah. No, instead he went the other way. He said, mm -hmm. you're so smart. But now mm -hmm. I know it was the greatest compliment I could receive from my beloved Gary Krabsoff. Mm -hmm. And so, wow. So, and we know, because we heard from Gary that like at that point he had already met Jessica Char and he was like kind of off and running on his teachings. So did you start to study the Jessica Char teachings then? Is that when you had it? Oh my God, that was it. <clears throat> yeah. That's how spirit brought us together. It was it. Yeah. So we met, but we really like each other. Yeah. And uh, and then, by the way, you know, I got, uh, that's what he did, and uh, and that's what I needed help with, and he gave me a little session, uh -huh. and he gave me this beautiful piece of paper. I still love his dra drawings, you know, I study all, Gary, anytime Gary put something on paper, you can study it, you can work <laughs> with it. <laughs> that's true, that is true, yes, i Oh. You know, and he, we do the stick figures, you know, we do stick figures, that yes. beautiful language of compassion, because by having the stick figures, we have something really practical that we can look at, come back to it by way of ourselves. Mm -hmm. And then Gary will say, as I study with him, every part of the drawing has meaning. Mm -hmm. So more you study and more you look at, more you practice, more you learn. Mm -hmm. Even from the simple uh, sequence that a Vini Yoga teacher can give you. And it's true, you know, it's a very. Uh, so, did the practice yeah. he gave you, I'm betting it so, helped your neck, huh? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then out of that, we got to also spend time together. And uh, I remember we had a few dates. He's, he had a, a best friend, Lee Lopez living mm. in the same uh, road in the area of upcountry that I didn't know that area on the hillside of Maui, blessed Maui. And I lived down to the blessed ocean <laughs> mm. uh, called uh, Maui Metal near what, above Wailea, beautiful beaches of Maui. And, uh, and so when I got invited to go visit his family house, he was living in the cottage. Gary was living in the cottage of his beloved mom and dad. You know, they all became my family. What a beautiful... Sorry, I never... No, that's, that's beautiful. <laughs> I, I totally get it. You know, my, my, my family, my family has all spread apart, and I don't, I don't get to see them. I'm not in touch with them, but my wife's family... They are tighter, and they've adopted me into that. So I get to be a part of their family. I really know what you mean. It's I'm so grateful for it, you know. Such a beautiful people, you know. They just move from Philadelphia, following the love themselves, courageous. I think mom, uh, Gloria Crafso, she was maybe turning 55 when I met her, or or 65, something like that, 65, I'm yeah. not sure, mm -hmm. 65, and uh, they, had, she had, they have a birthday, and they received me with such a love in this lovely place, and then mm -hmm. they had a, a cottage, part of their beautiful place, they had a cottage, and that's where Le Gary lived, mm -hmm. he just came back, basically, right. from uh, his study of he told us that his brother had moved there, and then he had family there, and so he kind of went back there after he had been uh, in India for a while, started yes, doing his thing. A, and what he told me was really that he felt was time for him to really immerse himself with his family. Because we know that we grow a lot when we have the courage, the love, and the curiosity to be as adult and as yogi with our family. Mm -hmm. Because we see, we see where we come from, we see the need of of uh, inquiry and transformation and therapy mm. sometimes, you know, to mm -hmm. relieve all suffering that we went through, that we cause one another, but we don't mean to, mm. and to reconnect that. So, Gary, I trust he was doing that work. Wow. Um, so when did you meet Desikachar? 
Ah, I met just Jessica Char just uh, the year after. So we're talking of uh, the year before we got married. So we got married in 85. Okay. And so, um, yes, we in 84 yeah. in Switzerland. Okay. And, and I'm sure you, you were getting teachings from him prior to uh, that because you, they come through Gary. But what was, what was your impression? What, what, what was your meeting with him like? Because you know, all the people have been coming on the podcast and they all say the same thing about Jessica Char, that it was really all about the relationship and like the way he related to you. <laughs> so what, um, was, what was your relationship to him? Oh, he adored me. You see, he loved Gary so deeply. Yeah. <laughs> he liked Gary a lot. I think, you know, I felt his love for Gary mm. deeply because the way he loved me, like a, like a daughter, mm. you know. And then he told Gary, he said, oh, I see. He likes also that I was Italian. I think he liked Italian forever. <laughs> and, and he gave me a compliment that I wasn't sure was a compliment. Remember, oh. English was still my second language. And so I had the English of a traveler. Although by then I was with Gary for almost a year. Um, we were in Maui for almost a year before I met Jessica Char, maybe a little less. And, uh, and so I, I learned a little bit more about <laughs> the fast English and Gary talks fast and I start chanting Sanskrit and studying with him right away. Mm. I knew, let me go back there for a moment. There was a moment we were in the car together, Gary and I, in one of our dates exploring at the island and he was sharing with me the Gaia tree. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I remember that, that sorry. No, <laughs> it's beautiful. <laughs> we were in the car going to, for those that know, the blessed land of Maui. It's, we call it now the Aina. It's really alive. The Panchamama is alive. <laughs> and we were going to Hana, which is the back uh, road of um, where it's all very green and... And he was chanting and chanting and chanting, you know, Gary is amazing, all the sutra by memory, of course, and I didn't know all that, but there was this particular chant, and I like chanting, so he was chanting for me, and I, and I remember saying, when he was doing the Gayatri, um, I said, oh, I'm going to be with this, I'm a traveler, right? I'm going to stay long enough to learn this chanting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and Gayatri is the power, a powerful mantra. It's one of my personal favorites. That one will get you every time. Isn't it? <laughs> yeah. But, you know, as a traveler, it's like you can't co account that I'm going to marry this man, you know. Yeah. But it's like, I'm going to stay long enough that I learn this chanting. <laughs> I'm going to keep this guy around long enough so I can learn the Gayatri at least. <laughs> uh, just to say how enchanted I was with his uh, with his the way he was sharing it, but particularly chanting was very powerful. Of course, I already mm. had my practice that I did every day with so much love. I would put a sheet on the beach <laughs> mm. and I would do my practice. That really was making a big difference, and so simple. That's the other thing. Practice was so simple that, you know, I'm kind of, and then I go back to Desika Char meeting me because you would, you would see yeah, what, what was I, the, what was the compliment well, that the you compliment, weren't sure was a compliment? Uh, yes, he was said to Gary because remember, even if he was a modern man, he was a Brahmin, mm. an Indian man, mm. and he was learning about being with us and really willing to learn and so on. But it was clear they treated me as Gary's, an extension of Gary. Mm -hmm. And I trust that that's honoring. And so he, he, and he knows Gary from when he was 19. Right. Here we are 10 years later, oh, 18 years later. No, what is it? Eight years later. So we met. The we were if you are hearing this message, then you're listening to the free version of J. Brown Yoga Talks. To hear the rest of our conversation, please subscribe to Podcast Premium 
at jbrownyoga.com slash premium.